Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, brought to you by NDIS Property Australia. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Hello everybody, my name is Min and I'm your host for today from NDS Property Australia here in Brisbane. And you're listening to the SDA Housing Podcast, a show that explains, highlights, guides and brings awareness about all things SDA in this ever-changing NDIS world. Today we have a great speaker, a, a great guest speaker. Thank you. The person who I, I've been trying to get for nine months. <laughs> <laughs> David Whitelaw from Adapt Housing, how are you? I'm very good. I'm very excited to be here. and Thank you for the invite. Normally, I don't have a script, but you've given me some topics here to cover. So I'll just say to you, the world's your oyster, blank sheet. What do you want to talk about? Who are you, David, and who is Adapt Housing? Yeah, look, uh, we're, we're primarily, well, we are just an SDA provider. Um, and um, we uh, effectively uh, work under a HMW Group, which is our accountancy firm. Um, the directors of HMW created a affordable housing, uh, social housing company about 13 years ago, and it's been very successful. Uh, under ANRAS, the National Rental Affordability Scheme, and those directors uh, from the success of that organisation created Adapt Housing about five years ago, and uh, and we've been playing in this SDA space for the last five years. It's uh, it's been intriguing, it's been difficult, um, but there is uh, some exciting things happening at the moment. So, what's your background for them to have dragged you into the SDA space? Um, so I've worked in the disability sector for about 30 years as an, as an educator. Uh, I worked in behavioural schools as a, a deputy principal principal. Uh, I have minor studies in psychosocial assessment and exceptionality and uh, my forte is, is really being a special ed teacher though. And, uh, and so I've been given, as I said, for about five years ago the opportunity to extend on that experience and uh, and support uh, participants uh, with uh, housing solutions and uh, and some of the exciting stuff that's happening at the moment that we're actually supporting um, people who I taught many years ago um, uh, and moving into in particular robust properties which uh, which we we have a lot of knowledge about that's great so that's the past let's talk about the future approval changes for SDA what do you, what are your comments about that topic there so we in the in the very early days um, that it was it was very difficult to get SDA approval, and um, and when we visited lots of support uh, organisations, SIL providers, um, there wasn't a lot of knowledge about SDA, and there's a bit of reluctance to to specifically talk about uh, supporting participants um, because th- th- there wasn't a lot of knowledge. Um, we, we've seen uh, some things starting to open up uh, with approvals. Um, however, um, over the last couple of years, we know that around 80% of participants don't get the right approval. Um, but there's lots of exciting things happening in this space at the moment where organisations, uh, you know, going through the approval processes, going through, uh, you know, the review processes, S100s, and then maybe even getting the AAT involved. Um, and we're just starting to see now some success um, of, uh, of participants getting the right funding um, and being able to support them moving into their forever homes. I believe the last quarter saw a lot of approvals going through the system um, compared to the last three quarters, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's probably got a lot to do with leadership uh, and changes in the NDIA. Um, and there's a lot of advocacy groups out there too that are really driving it and promoting it. Um, and then, you know... People like Brendan Wolf, for example, are, are great advocates for uh, for our industry. Uh, Brendan is a, is a lived um, a participant uh, going through the process at the moment. We work very closely with Brendan. Um, Brendan's so experienced, he's actually starting up his own consultancy business, just providing support for participants out there, and uh, certainly uh, proud to, to work alongside Brendan. Yeah, we did, we did a podcast with him a few weeks ago. 
And he, he told us that on the podcast publicly, recorded now, he's coming after your job too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I love working with Brandon. He, he's a great guy. And uh, I like to think that I'm mentoring him, but sometimes it's the other way around. <laughs> he's, he's mentoring me a fair bit. Yeah, he's, uh, I continue to work with Brandon, as I said. It's, uh, he's a great guy. So what, what do you have to say about opportunities for bespoke solutions? What do you mean by that? Yeah, look, we, we, we see uh, a lot of exciting things happening in this space at the moment. And, uh, and, and we've always tried to pitch ourselves as being bespoke. The, the key and the core focus, though, is making sure that properties get certified. Um, we work with some great SDA assessors and architects out there at the moment. The primary focus is, is, to, is to get certified. However, there are opportunities, whether it be through um, through construction, um, you know, through may- maybe even a PBSB, which is a behavioural plan, or uh, or a- 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 on completion of the build, being able to customise that build um, to to suit participants' needs uh, and wants, and um, and so. Providing that bespoke solution out there, there's certainly opportunities uh, through the NDIA and and just through our normal channels working with developers and investors as well. Are you getting a lot of developers and builders coming to you asking for advice as to what to build and where to build? Yeah, we do. We we don't uh, normally promote sites or regions um, and uh, and we give a lot of advice uh, when uh, developers come to us with locations already and we're able to do a bit of analysis around sites and relationships that we've got. And so our, our core focus is to help developers who already have the sites, who have the locations, who are, you know, putting putting different uh, configurations sort of together and, and uh, want to get advice on... On how it all works, and uh, and that's probably where our primary focus is. So we don't normally encourage sites, but we we do know, you know Gold Coast, for example, uh, it's difficult to get SDA uh, around that Gold Coast area. Um, land prices are going up, build costs are going up, and it's certainly becoming a little bit more difficult. But the, it, it still exists. Yeah. So. Speaking of regions like Gold Coast, I mean, you've spoken a lot to us about Tweed and the northern New South Wales area and region, region New South Wales as well, um, Tamworth specifically. Are there, are there any other areas you want to see more products, SA products in, uh, more SA products in certain regions? Yeah, look, um, we, we like flexibility. So there might be places that, um, you know, we've got SDA stock, um, however, there are 86 different combinations. So there is still an opportunity for some duplex, dual keys, villa developments. And, and the more flexibility we can provide in this space, the more opportunities we've got supporting participants moving into their forever home. So, so e- even though that, um, you know, there might be lots of builds in, you know, in the, say, Logan or Brisbane North or metropolitan uh, areas, we still know that being able to provide villa developments and duplexes um, I- improve livability, fully accessible. There are so many combinations, and so the opportunity to provide, you know, that bespoke solutions right across all build types and design categories still exist in this market at the moment. Can you explain to our listeners what you mean by eighty-six combinations? So, so. If a participant goes through a housing report or does a housing solution report, um, they'll be they'll achieve one of eighty six levels of funding, um, and properties when they get registered also receive one of those eighty six different combinations as a monetary value attached to each of those properties. So, so there are you know when we when we think about apartments, villas, you know group homes, houses, um, and then we've got. In, uh, improved livability, fully accessible, robust, high physical support with OOA, with no OOA, there are 86 different combinations. And having mm-hmm. having the ability to be flexible across those 86 different combinations is really powerful. And uh, and when we talk to investors and developers, we, we talk about being flexible and we talk about, uh, you know, being supportive and, and some, you know, potential outcomes. Uh, if someone gets high physical support apartment, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'd like to live in a high physical support apartment. There are so many different alternatives. 
you find that these investors are receptive to your reasoning on flexibility? Yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty conservative. Um, and fortunately, we've got uh, quite a fair few uh, active properties out there at the moment we can provide examples for. Um, and, uh, and we work with lots of other SDA providers as well as SIL providers and support providers. And, uh, and so we've got a really good grasp of what the market looks like at the moment and, uh, and how, how we can use that, that uh, SDA funding in a flexible way. For, for example, you know, someone who has shared funding, uh, there are opportunities, even if they've got shared funding, that can live independently, whether it be a villa or, a, or an apartment. It might be improved livability, fully accessible, all those sort of things. It's, it's a great opportunity to be flexible out there. Gotcha. There's some pretty big changes coming up in the in the sector, David. What's uh, what's your feedback on on these changes coming up? Yeah, we we talk to um, the the NDIA on a regular basis, and we we've got some really key contacts that support us, and we support them. Um, there's a couple of things. The five year review cycle is going to be a big one for the industry. Um, it's not just going to be CPI index next year. There's going to be significant changes um, to the to the pricing uh, arrangements. And um, we've sort of been told that, you know, there'll be maybe location factors will be uh, affected as, as well as the, the pricing and payment schedule with, with new builds. So we're seeing uh, some significant change. Well, there will be some significant changes uh, after the or the end of the five-year review cycle. Um, we've also been working closely with NDIA and, and they're talking about... Um, trying to explore more about the Appendix G, um, which uh, allows the flexibility of, uh, you know, families to, to live uh, together, uh, you know, friends to live together as well and, uh, and partners, and, um, and there's going to be a bit of work. That Appendix G is a pretty difficult formula to work out, and everyone interprets it, interprets it in a different way. And, um, and so there's going to be a lot of clarity around Appendix G probably the middle of next year, which would be really good. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also uh, changes in the design standards of SDA, which is good. I mean, the, the more that we can, you know, control, um, you know, the build types, um, the, the more quality builds we're going to get. What kind of changes do you think will come into those design changes? Um, it, it, one of the key factors is to provide more independence um, and, uh, and whether it's around AT, whether it's around uh, building materials, you know, it might be uh, more about more accessibility in particular, uh, not necessarily just within the house, but accessing the house from outside as well. So um, but it's probably more about based on, on materials, I think, at this stage, some of the feedback that we're getting at the moment. Gotcha. I want to ask you a little question, SWOT, S-W-O-T, SWOT analysis. Yep. What is your SWOT analysis of the NDIS, SDA sector at the moment? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats? Yeah, so um, look, our, our, our strength, ADAPT strength, is, is that flexibility. We, we don't have one build type and one design category. We, we have supporting investors come to us and they say, I can get a villa development on here, or I can get an apartment complex. So our, our strength is about um, is really about flexibility and being able to support all participants coming through. Um, our, our strength is is our our knowledge and our connections. And so we've been around for five years, and really, really, two of those five years was about. Uh, learning about the industry, talking to organisations, understanding SDA, understanding why locations are so important, understanding why amenities are important, transport's important. And so that, that's really our strength, is our knowledge and our connections as well. Our, our weaknesses, I, I guess, is that we can't cater for everyone. I, I'd, I'd love to provide everyone that approaches us with a dwelling. And unfortunately, the way the building industry is at, is at the moment, we just can't do that. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to try. Um, if we be flexible, we've got more of an opportunity. Uh, but it's certainly our, our weakness is, uh, is the fact that we can't provide dwellings for everyone. What about opportunities? The changes that are coming um, with uh, the way that the, the building industry is at the moment, they're, they're looking deeper into being able to reduce the cost to build, you know, the cost of land. Uh, as I said, the, the five-year review cycle will be really positive for us. Um, 
the, there are opportunities coming forward. Um, local councils, we, we tend to work very closely with local councils, getting them to understand SDA, um, and they're starting to open up more opportunities. If we've, you know, for example, a, a split a block where you've got a thousand square metre block can be sort of split into a little villa development. Um, you know, the councils are becoming more receptive to those sort of uh, guidelines and, and understanding. Um, yeah, so there, there are more opportunities when it comes to land development. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, the last one is threats. Now, I don't want to ask you the threat to your business, the threats to the industry, to the sector, the NDIS, the SDA. I mean, there's been a lot of press in the last few weeks or a month ago, about 60 minutes, you know, the uh, criminal, criminal, criminals yeah. ripping yeah. off the NDIS, yeah. the change of government being a positive step, I guess. What threats do you see are there for participants, the NDIS, the SDA? Are there any threats out there moving forwards? Um, look, we, we work with lots of organisations and we're, we're very selective who we work with. We, we love the organisations we work with, one, one of which is NDIS Property Australia. We've got a great relationship and we see the value of what you guys are bringing to the table. Thank you. Um, you, you, you come to us with, with lots of uh, opportunities and, and, again, being able to provide that flexibility about locations as well and, and opening up, uh, you know, states for us as well, which is really exciting. Um, the, the, the threats, I'm just sort of trying to think where the threats would come from. Here's one. In the news lately, there was the NDIS pulling funding for support coordinated to a critical part of the scheme for participants. That's one yeah, example there. yeah. Do you see that as a big, a big issue, or is that just overblown there? Yeah, we see we see a lot of stuff come through recently about SIL funding. We don't call it SIL; we call it support funding because that funding level comes from different ways. And um, and you know, three years ago, SIL was probably the most lucrative part of of the NDIA, and um, and probably over the last couple of years, we've seen a significant reduction. In SIL and 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 uh, you know support providers are are looking at alternative ways in in developing those rosters of care. Our, our model of, of developing SDA is very much to collaborate with a SIL provider. So so we value what that support provider is bringing to the table, and what we want to be able to do is is make sure that they've got the ability to to deliver their best supports. And we've got the ability to provide the best SDA outcome for them. So that's probably the biggest threat at the moment is the direction of uh, support providers and the flexibility in that funding because, as I said, that, that's very much a direct correlation with what we want to do. Surely the th- margins for SIL providers being squeezed, yeah, that will affect their bottom line to survive and operate. Mm-hmm. That's number one. Inflationary pressures for construction costs and labour force, um, lack of land around Australia to deliver product because the silver providers need product, the housing product, yeah. to run their business from. Yeah. So the gap between supply and demand is ever so more growing wider because of the that, that, that issue there, that threat there. Yeah. Your comments, your comments on those those matters? Yeah, it's, it's certainly we've we've seen a lot of projects that. Uh, haven't necessarily fallen over. They've slowed and stalled uh, is a phrase that I use a lot. Um, There is still some confidence that needs to be developed. You know, there are certainly opportunities and the land still exists, Um, but when builders are not providing fixed-price contracts, there's there's a bit of uneasiness in the the industry at the moment and uh, and it's got a plateau. You're right, it's got a plateau. We're we're waiting waiting for that, you know, the resource sort of uh, resources of builds and land costs to to come back to something that's more reasonable. And and as I said, the NDIA are looking at that five-year review cycle and that might be what builds that confidence in the industry again. Well, there'll be a positive turning point there, number one. Number two is the interest rate hikes going up every month, that will, call, that will cool off the property market, cool the demand by property investors for first-time buyers going in, releasing more land to the market for investors to get more land to build on. So that's a positive, yeah. I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, we've also got to get councils, you know, an SDA a duplex, for example, high physical support, um, you know, supports maybe two or three uh, participants or tenants going into SDA. But the the... 
the the opportunity of providing you know workers in, in that area is really good so there are so many benefits you know a, apart from just supporting participants with disability that you know we're, we're, we're starting to create jobs and employment um, how how the interest rates sort of affect that uh, again it is a bit of a threat at the moment and and we have seen some or some properties sort of stalled because of that reason um, it will plateau it, yep. it will plateau over time before we wrap up David, um, there was a employment forum a week ago in, in, down south in, with the Australian government, and number two on the top five lists of workers that require more employment in more empl- more employees joining the market is the disability aged care sector. Yeah, there's a massive demand for support workers, and yeah. I think I think hopefully that we see more migration, more visas approved, more influx of workers coming from overseas to help out with the massive um, the shortage of employment everywhere in Australia at the moment, mm. particularly the disability sector, because yeah. we're going to see more and more participants come into the in the IS, and as a result, we're going, to, we're going to require more support workers in the system to support the demand there. Yeah, and, and, and these support providers need trained workers as well, um, and, and, you know, on a regular basis, the NDI are throwing up... Uh, opportunities of training sessions and there are advocacy groups out there and and training groups providing uh you know training for you know new people entering the sector which is a really powerful thing however what what sda provides and what sda can do it 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 can build independence by you know providing hoist providing power windows and blinds and we're starting to see artificial intelligence come into the at as well and so participants can be very very independent um, there's still an opportunity for, for workers to be there, but the, the more customization and the more bespoke an SDA solution can be, the, the more opportunity someone's got of being independent. And that might reduce that, that level of workers. There is still going to be a high demand um, of specialist high demand as well, in particular robust as well. Um, but um, the, the, it is certainly a wider scale, whether it's just the disability sector or, or even the building industry. There still needs to be, um, you know, skilled workforce out there mm. to provide services. Totally agree, David. Any final words of advice before we hang up? Um, look, as I said, it's uh, it's about understanding. I, I there are some key factors about building SDA. It's about location. Um, it's about amenities, it's about being bespoke as much as we can, making sure that we're still getting um, certified and registered. Um, but for us, I, I, I can't stress more um, having the ability to be flexible uh, in this space um, reduces vacancy and, and creates much more opportunities for participants to, to find their forever homes. In life, there's an old saying, think with the end in mind. Mm-hmm. And I think... Any listeners here who are potential investors, you should think about the end goal of this product you're looking at investing in. It's it's a long term proposition, mm, absolutely. Yeah. And don't be a Scrooge. Spend the extra few dollars for making it a worthwhile product for the end user, yeah. so they're happy and they're going to live there forever as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David, this is the end of our first of two podcasts. So thank you so much for your time. Sure. I look forward to seeing you in twelve months' time again. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We'll, we'll certainly finish up with a couple of weeks. We it's all good. Thanks, mate. Bye bye. Cheers, bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure you are subscribed and following us so you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this podcast with those that could benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.